Okay, are we ready? Everybody's here for a detailed history of bottle caps, right? 1837 to present. No, I'm just kidding. I was like, I had to put something in there. That's, that's the other conference. Yes, I, that's the one I'm going to tomorrow. No, we're here to learn everything you needed to know about Kubernetes TLS, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, just a quick little slide about me. That QR code has my contact info and the link to the slides embedded in it. Don't worry if you miss this one, there will be another one later that has just a link to the slides and you'll be able to get to all this info. Um, I am working at HashiCorp now. I just rolled over there from Mesosphere. So we are hiring, by the way. That link goes to our careers page if you're interested. Um, yeah, I've been in IT for 20 some years now, 25, which makes me feel really, really old. And Kubernetes for about the last four. So, okay, good. Now the people are starting to trickle in. Stalling for time was the right move. So, why are you here? Doesn't everything handle TLS automatically these days and do a perfect job of it? Hands up everybody who's ever wanted to swear at their vendor because it didn't handle TLS certificates properly. Yeah, I know, there's a few hands going up. All right, who here works for a vendor and wants to swear at your own employer because they don't handle TLS? Pr okay, see, there's a few. I have a slide for both groups of you later. So yeah, no, things don't handle TLS as automatically as you'd like. Sometimes even when they do, you know, bugs, things go wrong. Uh, machines go down in the middle of updates. Uh, sometimes humans do those things. So we'll take a look at uh, some failure cases and how you can diagnose and hopefully resolve them. Uh, first, just for those people who maybe have a gap in their knowledge, um, a quick, very quick TLS 101. Uh, I'm going to tell you what Brian Redbeard, a former coworker of mine, refers to as high school physics lies. It's where you kind of give people the truth but in an approximate form and just kind of hand wave away all the nasty details. Um, if you want the nasty details, I have links later on to things like the original RFCs and white papers and stuff like that. You can spend your entire career learning about this stuff. I have not, but you could. So in the beginning, there was X500. I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of an X500 directory, but of course you have because that's all LDAP is. It's an evolution of the X500 directory structure. It's, you know, what is that, 31 years old now? Uh, X500 included a certificate PKI called X509. It was a substandard of the, the umbrella standard. And so when the internet decided it needed secure communications for things like buying rabbit food on eBay, then they said, well, okay, we already have this standard for secure communications. It's relatively easy to implement. It's part of this other directory standard, but it doesn't need to have the directory behind it. So they kind of took it and ran with it and it's evolved and so has the standard practice you know of browser makers and client writers and so on what is a certificate at base a certificate is just a structured document and it has information about the subject it has the subject's public key it has a signature from a certificate authority and most of them in fact pretty much all the ones you're likely to see these days have extensions that were defined in a later update of the standard that define things like what you can use that certificate for. Can you use it for code signing? Can you use it for server communications? Can it be a certificate authority? We'll see what that looks like in a second. Uh, some additional names for the subject, that's an extension. So there's a few things here. You can see the issuer, which is the certificate authority. This is obviously one that I generated for the demo. It has some info about when it is valid. Uh, it has some info about the subject that the authority issued the certificate to. In this case, the subject is just known as Kubernetes. And then down here is, you know, extended key usage. What can I use it for? Basic constraints. I cannot use it as a CA certificate. And then these are the alternative names because you can only have one canonical name, but you can have potentially many names and they're all defined in alternative names. So to have the CA issue a certificate, you generate your public key. You generate a certificate signing request with all the info in the certificate, sign it with your key and send it to the CA. They sign it with their key and send you back a certificate and you're in business. So what is an authority? It's a key pair and a certificate. That's basically in its most primitive form, that's what a certificate authority is. That's all you need to operate as your own CA should you wish to do so. Now there's more stuff around that. 
that CAs typically are expected to manage, things like certificate revocation lists and certificate logs and transparency logs, but they're not technically necessary to be a CA just to issue certificates. And so this is really all that defines a CA right here, is this basic constraint that says CA true. That means this is a CA certificate. That's the only difference. Uh, typically, you will not see CAs use their actual root certificate to sign yours. They create themselves intermediate certificates, and that's so that if an intermediate certificate is compromised, they don't go out of business. Uh, I don't know if anybody here noticed, but Symantec basically did go out of business because they had a compromise that was severe enough that basically all the OS and browser makers in the world said, we simply don't trust you anymore. You, you messed up too, just too bad. Do you need to be a certificate authority? I said you can be. Do you need to be? You might be already. A lot of products have a certificate authority embedded in them that they use to bootstrap themselves if you don't feed them certificates at install time. And if you don't know if you have one of those, you probably do and you probably better find out about it because if somebody manages to break in and subvert that CA, they can do two things. They can issue themselves certificates, which they don't even have to subvert the CA to do. They just have to find an exposed endpoint and say, give me a certificate. And if your CA says, here you go, well, now that as far as you know, they're a trusted party. Uh, the other thing is a compromised CA means that they now have the key that was used to create all of your legitimate certificates, which is not a good thing either. Uh, but if you, you may want or need to be your own CA, if you're not already, because you need to own your root of trust. You need to rotate certificates regularly, but you're air gapped, so you can't use something like Let's Encrypt, or it would cost you too much money from a third party CA. Uh, you have a lot of certificates and you need to be able to issue them right away, like basically on demand. Um, you can use the Acme stuff that Let's Encrypt is based on for that locally, but uh, sometimes people prefer just to do it the old fashioned way. Or, you know, you like being frustrated and annoyed. Um, I can't tell you how many times during preparation of this talk I was like, why does it work that way? Well, it just does. <laughs> okay. Now, there's several slides below this one. I'm not going to go past the first one, but there are other opinion slides below this, and if you want to see them, you can just go to the slide link and feel free to read them and, and tell me on Twitter how I'm completely wrong about everything I said there. Um, this one I am completely right about. If you're a vendor and you claim your product is enterprise ready, you have to be able to do these things at minimum. And here's the point score you get for doing them. If you generate a self-signed wildcard leaf and you use it for everything, Minus 50 points. You did the absolute minimum and you're promoting terrible security practices in the bargain. And a lot of stuff simply won't even work with that kind of certificate anymore because it's such a terrible thing to do. Generate a CA, use it to create leaf certificates, you get a few points for that. Accept a user CA and key and use that to create leaf certificates, you get some more points for that. Here's where the points start racking up. If you can handle certificate rotation, without it being a huge pain, you get some, some serious points for that. And, and the reason I give this the most points is because this is all most enterprises can do. If you can accept a user supplied CA and a set of LEAF certificates and just use them as is without generating anything of your own, you get all the points. And then if you get all the points, you get 10 bonus points just because I'm feeling generous. And if you enable Let's Encrypt in your, whatever your product is, you get 20 bonus points. You get to you know, wave a flag and tell people that you're awesome. Uh, correspondingly, on the other side, if you're an enterprise customer and your vendor comes in and demos a cool new product and you say, well, what about TLS? And they say, well, we can generate a wildcard leaf certificate. Kick them out the door. Don't let them back in until they can do this stuff properly. I mean, I'm serious about that. It's amazing. How many vendors go, yeah, that's coming in the next release. And then the next release comes out and they go, eh, next one, next one, next one. And they never get around to it. And then finally they bring out a new product and you're like, well, what about TLS? Oh, that'll be done in the next release of this new product. I said I wasn't gonna go there. So how does TLS break? There's a couple of common ways that it breaks that we're looking for. The most common thing is just a broken trust chain. You have to trust the root CA. You have to trust every intermediate certificate in the chain. If, you're, if you don't trust the root CA, 
If there's a missing intermediate certificate, maybe you would trust them all if you had them all to build the full chain with, or you know, not you, but your browser or your client. Uh, but if it's not there, if it's marked specifically as untrusted, then you have a broken chain. It means that none of the LEAF certificates will be trusted either. Your certificate's not correctly formed. There's a couple of different ways that this commonly happens. Uh, host names and IPs are checked against the name and the IP requested. Now, this is a very exact check. You can't put a host name in the certificate and then have the IP that that name resolves to just work. The IP has to be in the certificate as well. And whatever's in the canonical name has to be in the subject alternative name too. In fact, um, it did not used to be that way in practice, but somebody started reading the spec really stringently and so it became common practice to basically just ignore the common name if it wasn't in the subject alternative names. And now, uh, I was just reading, it as I was prepping this talk, uh, Google has now just dropped parsing the canonical name completely. Subject alternative name is all they look at in Chrome now. Uh, if you list IPs as names, it's an exact match only. There's no wildcard IPs. And you see certificates out there that have wildcard IPs in their SANs, and that doesn't work. So, you know, you go to try to access something by IP with that certificate, and even though it's a technically a valid certificate, it's not a valid trust. Uh, this is probably the second most common one, actually, but I listed it last. Uh, certificates are only valid for a limited time. Now, that limited time can be as long as you or your certificate authority like, but it does expire at some point. There's no such thing as an indefinite certificate. And CA certificates expire too. So if your CA certificate expired and your LEAF certificate somehow was issued to have an expiration time after the CA certificate expired, a lot of clients won't accept that either because they go, well, the CA expired. It's not valid anymore. How can anything it issued be valid anymore? There's some extra security that's sort of outside of the outside of the uh, actual X509 standard. Uh, there's this key pinning and certificate pinning thing where your client or your web browser will actually, the first time you access a site and get a certificate and a key, it remembers them and then it compares them the next time. And if they change the next time and there isn't a very specific process followed to change them over clean, then it just throws an error and says, you know, somebody's trying to do something nasty. It assumes that you're, the website you're going to has been compromised because the key changed or the certificate changed in a way that it doesn't like. Uh, the other thing is low security configurations, like those self-signed LEAF certificates, or it used to be common to see SHA-1 signature hashes in a certificate. Those aren't allowed anymore. If you have a certificate that uses SHA-1, it's going to be rejected now. So like I said, stuff breaks, but under what circumstances would you see it break? Generally, because somebody made a mistake with the setup in the first place, because a rotation failed, or somebody just let it sit too long. Certificates expired. So, you know, the next time somebody comes back to it, they've got an expired certificate, their, their clients are failing, their peers are failing, whatever the case may be. Where in Kubernetes will it break? Well, there's a few places it can break. Anything that talks to the API server, other control plane components, kubelets, any add-ons or utilities you've installed. Anybody here ever install Weave Scope? No? A few? Yeah. Uh, Weave Scope talks to the API server all the time. So if the API server certificates aren't in order, Weave Scope will just refuse to talk to it. The API server talks to other things. It talks to etcd, it talks to the kubelets to get info on them. Uh, and all of these transactions have a second side, which is the client verification. The API server is not going to let you talk to it unless you're allowed to. So it's doing client verification, and that may or may not have the same configuration. It may or may not use the same certificate authority, for example, as the serving certificate. So you can actually have two different CAs. You can have one for the certificate that the API server presents, and a different one for these client certificates that the API server authenticates. And then, of course, your own applications. That's kind of where you come in. You have to make sure that your own applications can handle and use TLS certificates properly. So how do you debug any of it? 
we're going to see some of this in detail later as much as I have time for. Um, I think we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, the first thing is output and logs. If you're centrally logging, if you've got Splunk running or, you know, whatever your central log system of choice is, uh, you know, elk stack, whatever it is, go ahead and search through your logs for TLS errors. I bet you'll see a few, even if it's fairly harmless stuff. But if you're not and something's failing, you know, if it's a Kubernetes pod, you can always do a cube control logs. If it's a control plane component that's not running as a pod, you know, you did it the old fashioned way and ran it as a systemd service, then you just journal control dash u. Uh, or, you know, if it's running in a Docker container, you can do a Docker logs. No big deal there. Uh, you can examine the certificates directly in a couple of ways. Open SSL, it's big, it's ugly, it's old. The code base is a mess, but you're going to end up using it a lot. So you might as well learn how to do the two or three useful things with it that you need to know how to do. So the decode for a standard TLS certificate uses the X509 subcommand. That no out there, even though it is going to give you output, the no out means don't write a file out. It's one of the weird things that OpenSSL has. Write it out in text format, and then you give it a certificate file. You can also pipe things to it, in which case you don't need the dash in argument. You can just pipe output from something to OpenSSL X509. And it'll you know decode it and dump it to standard out, and you can scroll back up and down and look at what's going on. If you don't have access to the actual file, but you're trying to decode you know, what might be going wrong with something you're trying to connect to, it actually has an SSL client that will connect to whatever host and port you give it. There's a show search flag that will dump out the certificate blobs. Then you can pipe them to OpenSSL X509 and decode them and look at them that way, even if you don't have access to the actual files. And if that endpoint isn't exposed outside your cluster, so you know you can't just do it from your laptop, you can always run a debug container on the host somehow. You know, run a Docker container, attach it to the same network as the target container service, and then run OpenSSL. Um, you're not going to see that necessarily, but I actually did that while I was developing this talk, and I used Alpine for it. So you just run an Alpine container, APK add OpenSSL, and you're in business. So, demo time. Uh, let's see, what time is it? All right, I've got time for probably the whole thing. So I have this lovely little demo. This is actually running on a flat car Linux VM on this laptop. Um, it's going to spin up just enough Kubernetes control plane components that we can do some nifty stuff. So the first thing is I need to go into my demo and make sure that everything's where it should be. And then I bootstrap the demo. Okay, and this is now using CFSSL to generate a bunch of CAs and certificates and create cube configs, and then it's starting up a bunch of Docker containers, and I go Docker PS, and everything looks great, and so I export cube config. Uh, let's see, admin kubeconfig.yaml. All right, and now I do a kubectl get nodes. Oh, what happened? What's going on with my Docker PS? Something failed, the API server failed. So why did the API server fail? Well, let's take a look. Let's do a Docker logs, since it's not running. Okay, so we get this nasty go exception here. Certificate has expired or is not yet valid. Well, it's obviously trying to connect to etcd. So let's take a look at etcd. Um, I'll go ahead and do that s client. Connect. See, this proves that I'm not faking the demo. Because nobody would fake a demo with this terrible typing. Okay. Show certs. I'm just going to pipe it straight to OpenSSL X509. No out. Test. So I know what I'm looking for. I'm just, you know, kind of showing you where you can actually see this stuff. Uh, where's my, okay, not before, not after. Well, November 17th, 114 GMT, 
this certificate was only valid for one second because that's what I generated to so that I would know that it would be expired for this demo. But it so happens that I have a fixed version of it and I have my script that I use to start etcd here. Okay, so etcd Alright, we'll fix it. We're going to pretend we actually went and edited the certificate and fixed it. Okay. So, now that's perfectly fine, right? Alright, so it gives us, alright, so we're not getting, oh I didn't show you, but etcd actually tries to connect to itself, so you would see the expired certificate stuff there too. Uh, everything looks good, it's listening for peers, it did an election. I think I can start up my Cube API server again. Okay, let's see how that goes. Oh man, what did I forget? I forgot to put any, any host names in the IP sans. So again, and this is going to fail before I get back to it, but again I have to edit my etcd and I have a version that I call correct and it has the IP sans in it and then let's see what we get okay run etcd again okay everything looks good I'm thinking my docker ps is going to show that the API server failed it did so let's run the API server again okay Ah, now things look good. Okay, ah, oh, okay, so it's running, but what is this? Something's trying to authenticate to it and it's failing. Well, the only other thing here that's actually connecting to etcd right now is the kube scheduler. So let's look at the logs for the kube scheduler. And we'll see. Okay, so here it's trying to connect to the API server and it's getting unauthorized. Now, I could spend a lot of time going through everything on the cube scheduler. I'm going to tell you right up front, everything on the cube scheduler is fine. The problem is, again, with the cube API server. So, let's take a look at the cube API server's client config. Okay, so we've got a client CA file. I'm pretty sure that's not the CA file that I intended to be authenticating clients with. So if I go through and I look at that one, in Kubernetes, on Doom, let's see who this belongs to. Whoops, I forgot my X509. Okay, so everything looks good. It is a CA certificate, that's fine. It's valid, that's fine. Oh, this is Victor Von Doom's CA certificate. We don't want Victor Von Doom authenticating clients. This would actually potentially be something you would look at and go, I think I've been subverted. If somebody's able to substitute a bad or incorrect client CA verification file. Uh, so let's see, so let's fix that. Again, I already have the correct file prepped so we can Fix that, kick Victor Von Doom out of our environment, run the Cube API server again, everything goes through. All right, so now we're not getting those nasty client errors. We are still getting some errors. That's normal because we just have a little stump of a cluster here. Let's take a look at our, whoops, where was my logs for the, yeah. Okay, so now the Cube scheduler is connecting fine. So we can go back and do our kubectl, right? Whoops. Kubectl get nodes. No, we can't. Our kube config is not correct. This is actually also a TLS problem because the TLS certificate for the client for kube config is embedded in the kube config itself. Now, you can actually pull that out with kubectl and jq and all that. I already wrote a script to do it so that we can just look at it without you watching me type all that out. And here's the problem. The subject info is not correct. I'm not in the right group, 
and I'm also not the right canonical user. So, if I export, whoops, export admin client, and now if I get nodes, this is what I should see because I have this tiny little cluster. There's no nodes, there's no pods. It doesn't even know component statuses. But the point is I'm not getting that TLS error anymore. So, we have a few minutes. Anybody have any questions? No? Yeah? Oh, okay, in the back. Yeah, um, two quick ones. One is, I mean, it looks like you, you were deploying all the components. I mean, you are kind of doing it the hard way, right? Yeah, exactly. This is derived from so Kubernetes. These days, yeah. Most, most things would, but like I said, sometimes a certificate rotation goes wrong. Or somebody's attacked your cluster and managed to subvert your CA certificate somehow. So you still want to be able to go in and recognize what's going on and, and where you need to go to debug it and, and figure out maybe who did it or what did it. And another question is on the app development side of things. I mean, as an app developer these days, cloud native app developer these days, mm -hmm. aren't I supposed to just not worry about TLS anymore and let uh, Istio and MTLS take care of it for me? You would think that. Uh, it's not quite as simple as that, though. Uh, I was actually a sysadmin for an app development group, and that was when I first ended up running my own certificate authority because they were developing in a Flash framework where the browser uh, component of the framework simply would not accept a self-signed certificate. There was no way to make it do it. It had to be signed by a trusted CA. So then it was up to me to actually put that trusted CA into the server-side systems, and then they had to also put it into their browsers you know, this was, you know, this was in a lab environment, but still, it was something that the developers had to be able to recognize and come to me and go, this is what we need, you know, how can you help us out? I'll go ahead and flip over to, this is the further info slide. I said there would be some links. Um, there's a couple of talks, if anybody went to Connor Gilbert's talk earlier today, he touched on some of this, and it looks like, judging by the description, tomorrow's talk, Duffy Cooley and Nicholas Lane, is going to go into a lot of this around certificate rotation and such. So, yes? Um, for a cluster that you have, I mean, something that you have deployed, you'll have a CA that is created by yourself. Right? So, what happens if that is compromised? How do you uh, rotate the whole thing? Well, that's kind of a disaster scenario, right? Because if your CA gets compromised, you can't trust any certificates that it's issued at least since the compromise, maybe not ever. Um, I would tend to think that at that point you have to invalidate everything that it's ever issued and start over. And they're actually, I think they're talking about expired certificates tomorrow, but I think some of what they're going to go into is actually going to be kind of in the same vein, like your certificates are all bad and have to be regenerated, what do you do? Some of it, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't like see their talk in advance or anything, but just judging by the description, it looks like if that's the kind of thing that you're looking at, you'll want to go to their talk as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Do you think there's any, anything we could or should be doing in kind of core Kubernetes that makes any of this easier? The biggest thing I think is certificate rotation is still a pain, and everybody has to solve it independently. And everybody seems to solve it a little bit differently. And it would be nice if that was just a core feature. Like, here's an endpoint. It's time to rotate certificates. Here's a new CA certificate or generate one. You know, here's the new key if it's one that I'm giving you. And just go out and do what needs to be done. 